Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to the Appalachian Rainforest. It's probably been mentioned to me before in previous videos, but Appalachian Rainforest, I was just assuming it was like woodland and just forest and like rainforest is like, to me, I'm thinking of tropical things, you know? Um, obviously that's a jungle, so it's a bit different. But rainforest and the jungle is the same thing actually, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. That's my knowledge coming into play. Could be completely wrong with that, but... The Appalachian Rainforest. We're going to check this out. Hopefully going to enjoy. I mean, I know the scenery here is like, beautiful. But in a rainforest, I assume it's just a whole different level. And I assume also like a lot of this is probably like, not untouched land. But very few, like, blah, 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 very few humans probably go here. So it's just going to be full of wildlife that you won't really find anywhere else in the US. We're going to check this out. Hopefully going to enjoy. Um... And yeah, let's check this out. I'm on my way to a really cool grove of old growth rainforest, but I've had to bail on my hike this morning because the water level of this river crossing is just way too high. I'm out here trying to make a video about the rainforest and the rainforest is kicking my ass. When you think of rainforests, you probably think of the Amazon or the Congo. These are tropical rainforests. The Appalachians are something much less common a temporary rainforest. Most sources agree on a few main qualifiers. Lots of rain all year, not just during a rainy season. Cool overcast summers and a colder winter, and some other indicators like the absence of wildfire or epiphytes, plants growing on other plants. From those conditions, we get a map of the temperate rainforest zone, the largest and most famous. So these are all the, ah, oh, what? Rainforest throughout Ireland? Scotland, Wales, and Cornwall in the UK and Ireland. Damn. This is in the Pacific Northwest, with other large chunks in Chile, New Zealand, Japan, the Himalayas, and some splotches along the western coasts of Europe. But if you squint your eyes, you'll see a tiny spot in the eastern United States. Squint harder and you'll see steep mountainous terrain, with peaks like Mount Mitchell and Clingman's Dome towering several thousand feet above the surrounding landscape. You'll see the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico nearby, sending large storms and weather systems that smack into these mountains, dropping as much as 220 centimeters of rain each year. And you'll see the result, a dense forest home to more than 20,000 species, hundreds of trees, thousands of plants and fungi, more than 500 mosses and ferns. A handful are only found here, and new ones continue to be described. This is one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth but also one of the most rare. This forest is only an echo of what it was millennia, centuries, even decades ago. It's seen populations come and go, acting as a barrier to some and a refuge to others. These groups have incorporated this forest into their beliefs, built a relationship with it, changed it, and today it looks very different because of them. Footprints are washed away and grown over in a place like this. But if you know where to look, you can find them. I'd like to show you why this rainforest has meant so much to so many. And I'd like to show you what it means to me today. Okay. Here we go. It does look very beautiful. I'm on my way up to the summit of Mount Mitchell, the highest point here in the Appalachians. I first visited this mountain about six years ago and shot this footage. It's not very good, but I think it captures what I was feeling. Just amazement at this carpet of moss and ferns, clouds rolling through perfect pointy trees. I had no idea that a place close to home could look anything like this. So I came back. I started seeking out more places like this. I started seeing my backyard a bit differently. And many of my obsessions today, mountains, forests, hiking, rain, they start here. This is a spruce fir forest found at the highest elevations of the Appalachian rainforest zone. And 16 year old me was onto something. This forest is unlike anything else and for good reason. Thousands of years ago, the northern end of this mountain range was buried under glaciers. As the ice advanced, species native to the north moved south to avoid extinction. When the glaciers retreated and the climate warmed, those species climbed to higher elevations looking for the colder conditions they were used to. 
Now, in mountaintops here in the south, you find a landscape that feels almost like Canada. Many of these species ended up stuck on mountaintops with no way of migrating elsewhere, and they evolved into a web of species found only here, some only on individual summits. These mountaintops are often described as biological islands or time capsules. I like to think of them as geological footprints left behind by the retreating ice. At the foot of these peaks are coves, sheltered valleys where rich soil, mild climates, and rain from the mountains above allow for insane biodiversity. These cove forests are the most biodiverse temperate ecosystem in North America, one of the most biodiverse in the world, and they're home to trees of record size and height for many species. They're the best remaining example of the old growth deciduous forest that once covered much of the eastern United States. In 1995, the Fish and Wildlife Service put out a report identifying endangered ecosystems in the U.S. Topping the list are the spruce fir forest and the old growth eastern deciduous forest. I'm making my way up to what should be a really cool grove of old growth Appalachian rainforest. That's a big ass tree by the way, look at the size of the, the bottom. It's a cove forest in a sheltered valley with big rainy mountains on three sides. So basically the ideal place for the growth of big old trees. When colonists first arrived on the East Coast, these mountains were a massive barrier to westward expansion, particularly here in the <coughs> South. Steep slopes and dense vegetation made travel nearly impossible and allowed this rainforest zone to remain wilderness for centuries while the lowlands were quickly populated and exploited. Eventually, white settlers began messing around in the mountains. In 1716, Virginia Governor Alexander Spotswood led the first white crossing of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And in the early 19th century, geologists began surveying and mapping the highest peaks. In 1828, geologist Elisha Mitchell is working on a survey. So I said this is untouched. From base what I'm seeing, this is not untouched at all. So take that back, but even then it's still like gonna be a hot spot for wildlife and stuff. North Carolina. He suspects the peak that would later become Mount Mitchell is the highest in the region and begins surveying the mountain, following animal trails through dense terrain for almost 30 miles a day and lugging heavy barometric equipment to measure elevation. 12 years later, he summits, estimating a 6,672 foot elevation, higher than any other mountain in the Eastern US and just 12 feet shy of today's measurement. But in 1855, a former student suggests that Mitchell was wrong, so Mitchell goes back to double check his measurements and disappears on the mountain slopes. His body is found the next week at the base of a waterfall, probably having slipped, hit a rock, and drowned. Oh, geez. With much of the region mapped and populations growing on the coast, white settlers began setting up shop in the mountains, attempting to make this terrain profitable through logging and mining. Indigenous groups were pushed further west and further up, some taking refuge in this high rainforest zone. Bears and other wildlife followed, pushed close to extinction by hunting and habitat loss. In the late 1800s, commercial logging began reaching into this rainforest zone. Timber companies scooped up huge areas of forest, paying loggers next to nothing to work in horrible conditions. Over the following decades, increasingly industrial logging reached more remote areas and cleared land faster. And by the 1930s, almost all of the old growth in the mountains was logged, including the largest trees deep in the coves. Logging made it all the way to the summit of Mount Mitchell, with a railroad to the summit built in 1911, allowing oh, rapid deforestation of that spruce fir forest found at the highest elevations. The timber industry eventually dried up, leaving many in the mountains struggling to make a living on already degraded land. Today, only pockets of old growth remain, providing a glimpse of how much of this forest would have felt centuries ago. This caught my eye while I was out hiking about a year ago, this old truck in the middle of the woods, nowhere near any road. <laughs> I occasionally see stuff like this out hiking, like old cars, more often chimneys or cabins, and just wonder, what are you doing here? Like, whose was this and how did it end up 
all the way out here. This mountain used to have a fire lookout on it, and the trail that I was hiking on used to be the road to that lookout. So this is probably just an old Forest Service truck. But I want to show you a different set of old stuff in the woods. They're a bit tougher to find, but I think they have a really interesting story. In 1914, the logging railroad on Mount Mitchell started letting tourists pay to ride to the top. Thousands of people visited the summit, saw this one-of-a-kind forest, and saw it being quickly cut down. They rallied for its protection, and in 1915, Mount Mitchell became the region's first state park, setting the example for a much larger project. The Great Smoky Mountains make up the largest chunk of the rainforest zone, along with the largest chunk of old-growth forest. This is where the Appalachian rainforest is at its best. But in the 1920s, more than two-thirds of the mountain's forests had already been logged, with much of what remained at the highest elevations and 85% of the land held by just a handful of logging companies. In 1923, local activists started pushing for the protection of this area as a national park, promoting it as the last great untouched wilderness in the eastern U.S. They spent 17 years raising more than $10 million, fighting logging companies, and mapping out a pretty remarkable park. With one problem, this was never the untouched wilderness that they made it out to be. More than 4,000 people lived within the proposed park boundary. Many Damn. in logging towns were trying to make a living farming previously logged land. Park promoters wrote some pretty wild stuff about these guys, referring to them as contemporary ancestors still living in the 1700s. My. But they insisted that these residents could keep living here. The park wouldn't be a problem. In 1928, the Park Commission started buying land from these residents. For some, this was a good opportunity to buy more productive land elsewhere. But others refused to sell, particularly those living in the coves, where fertile land made farming more sustainable. The next year, the Park Commission condemned their first property. And in the following years, more than 700 families were forced to sell and leave. Many who sold their homes turned around and put the money in banks. Of course, 1929 wasn't a great year to do oh. that. Most traces of settlement were torn down, and those that remain have become historic sites. One exception is the cemeteries. Most are away from roads and trails, and have been allowed to remain undisturbed while this forest has grown back up around them. Wow. That is... This is like, I could imagine like a horror movie is being filmed this in this sort of area, man. A cemetery in the woods like this. In the dark, this would be creepy as hell. An instrumental figure in the park's establishment was George Masa, a Japanese immigrant who devoted much of his life to photographing the landscape of the Southern Appalachians. His images depict both the high mountain landscape and the industries reaching into it, and were used to lobby and advocate for the park's establishment. Masa died in 1933, and the next year, the park was completed. It's since become an international biosphere reserve and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's not an untouched wilderness, and it never was. But it is something special. I'm walking along a really interesting path. In the 1830s, it was a wagon road used by people living and working in the surrounding mountains. But for centuries before that, it was a footpath, a part of a much longer one connecting either side of this mountain range. It included offshoots to other locations, including the summit of Klingman's Dome nearby, and it was also part of a much larger network of paths connecting really the entire region. Before colonization- It's crazy how they can, tr like they can, they know this stuff from like, a time when would stuff even have been traced back then? I find it so fascinating that they've got the history of this little, <laughs> this little path. This region was inhabited by a quilt of indigenous groups. The largest was the Cherokee, whose territory included much of this mountainous rainforest zone. Their first contact with white settlers took place in 1540, encountering Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto traveling through a section of North Carolina's rainforest. By the end of the 1700s, disease and the slave trade had wiped out dozens of neighboring groups, and many of those remaining had taken refuge in Cherokee territory. 
As white settlers advanced across the mountains, the Cherokee were pushed further west. Politicians stoked wars and encouraged colonists to harass and attack their Cherokee neighbors. In the 1830s, the discovery of gold on Cherokee territory brought an influx of new settlers, and in 1838, the military arrested and forcibly removed 16,000 people, forcing them to walk west to Oklahoma. What the fuck? 12,000 made it to the other side. About a thousand Cherokee managed to remain in the mountains and maintain a more traditional culture, and in the early 1900s, they became the federally recognized Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. They bought back a chunk of their land, a mountainous area in the Great Smoky Mountains, and then sold a chunk of it to the Park Commission to help establish the national park. When white settlers first began crossing over this mountain range and climbing the highest peaks, they relied on the help of Cherokee guides to locate mountain passes and navigate the rugged terrain. The Cherokee knew the best routes across the mountains and had climbed the highest peaks. They had thoroughly traversed this terrain, identifying the best places to live, hunt, and farm, and the best routes to travel. They had developed a culture inseparable from the region's geography, with traditional stories taking place in real locations they would visit and they had connected all of these places with an extensive network of footpaths all across the region. White settlers used these footpaths to trade, to move inland, and to push the Cherokee further west. In the centuries since, most of these paths have become roads, first wagon roads, and eventually highways. And today, much of the transportation system in this region is based on this network of footpaths built centuries before. Wow. This trail within the park is one of a handful that you can still walk on today. That offshoot path to the summit of Clingman's Dome was probably ceremonial. In Cherokee stories, the summit is the home of the white bear, chief of bears. This was a place bears would come to be healed and gather to celebrate before hibernating. Here's a spot that doesn't look like much, but it's stamped into my memory because this is where I saw my first bear. Kind of. I had seen bears like by the road or in my grandparents' backyard, but this was the first time that I properly shared a space with a bear. Like I was definitely the one wandering into his backyard. I was hiking up here, came around this bend. Bear was down here looking for fish in this little stream, I guess. I saw bear. Bear saw me. Oh, I saw we him. went our separate ways <coughs> and I quickly returned to my own habitat. It's been over a century since the height of the logging industry in the southern Appalachians, and across much of the region, forests are maturing and species are returning, including the most iconic symbol of these mountains. In recent decades, black bears have been making a huge comeback, reclaiming about half of their original range. Since 1970, Great Smoky's bear population has climbed from just 600 to almost 2,000, and other areas have seen much faster growth. A growing population also means bears are increasingly moving out of the high mountains and into nearby neighborhoods and towns. Cherokee beliefs consider bears human, and they're not alone in that suggestion. Across the world, cultures from Canada's First Nations to ancient Roman philosophers have told stories about bears as people or close to it. You may have seen this claim online that bears are often observed just hanging out looking at mountains or lakes, with the best biological explanation being that they just find nature pretty. As far as I can tell, this claim begins with Maureen Inns, a naturalist and artist who spent years living with grizzly bears in Kamchatka. Huh? She started to notice the bears building these nests in places with scenic views and just looking at that view for a long time and she suggested that maybe they have this aesthetic appreciation of nature. There isn't much research into this, and I'm not sure how you would even study what a bear thinks, but it is fun to speculate. If the bears do see beauty in their own backyard, what do they see in mine? This is his back garden. Oh do they see their paw days. prints? Do they see the place Fuck they that. caught their first fish? The den where their cubs were born? or just a stream, and just a tree. I like to think they see something that matters to them, and that I can take a pointer from the bears. 
to see the beauty in my own backyard, and to see not just what it is, but what it used to be. Maybe this untouched forest without people never existed. But maybe that's what makes this place special. Maybe someone stood here, crossed oceans to be here, refused to walk away. Someone loved this place, and maybe that's reason enough to love it today. Maybe we can follow the footprints. It's a beautiful damn place. Well, there you go. Oh, I've actually reacted to this. I've actually reacted to this guy before. Scotland's Secret Rainforest. I think I can watch this in my own time. This channel could be just about the study of rainforest for the rest of Aiden's career, and I'm here for it. I mean, yeah, they're really cool, aren't they? Like rainforest, just a very, it's just a bougie forest, and the forests themselves are like they're pretty insane. But um, this is a cool video looking at this because I mean. I wouldn't have even expected it to be a rainforest within Appalachia, but there you go. The more you know. But um, hopefully you enjoyed this reaction. If you've been here before, let me know what it's like. I don't know how often. Is this actually like a big tourist sort of spot that people go to? I'm definitely wrong with what I said at the start of how this is untouched. He literally described it himself, how it isn't untouched, but still beautiful nevertheless. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Until next time, like, subscribe, and peace.